Well, thank you. So, every time I visit Denver, I sleep extremely well. No kidding. Every time I'm in Denver, I sleep like a baby. Now, let's, don't get me, don't get, be misled by the title of my talk. This isn't because Colorado may have better cannabis policy than Tennessee and that I might find that comforting, though it does and I do. But actually, let me get to why I rest so well in Denver here in a few minutes. Because the need for cannabis reform is urgent. It's a matter of base rationality. In fact, it's an ethical and a moral issue, and it's urgent right here in the South and right here in Tennessee. Now, cannabis reform comes in three primary phases. Decriminalization, compassionate access, and adult use. So let's take them one by one. Now, many legislatures recognize that cannabis prohibition is unjust, so they'll take steps to decriminalize cannabis before installing full-fledged cannabis programs in their state. This simply removes the notion of criminality with regard to cannabis. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but one of the simplest and most conservative, in fact, is to say, well, cannabis may still be illegal, but we're going to make it a simple civil matter, a fine. Now, this is a half measure, to be clear. But importantly, it removes the prospect of incarceration for simple possession. So, let's talk about incarceration and all the things that come with it. First of all, it's fiscally irresponsible. For such a conservative state, we sure do blow a lot of taxpayer money processing, adjudicating, housing, and feeding cannabis users. But more than that, it adds to a perpetual feedback loop in impoverished communities. If a cannabis user is in a lockup, they're not showing up to a job, earning money, providing for family, saving, building credit. These are all the building blocks of breaking cycles of poverty. And exactly none of it can happen from jail. We're keeping poor people poor, and we codify it with bad cannabis policy. Now, an opponent might argue that breaking the law is a matter of personal choice and that if you refrain from breaking the law, then you don't go to jail and experience all the bad things that come with it. All right, fine. Fair enough. But let's talk about that word choice. Because half of all Americans say they've tried cannabis and 12% say that they regularly use Half use cannabis, but 12 regularly use. Heck, there are more cannabis users than vegetarians in this country. 5% of Americans don't eat meat, but 12% regularly use cannabis. So I have to ask you, what is the use in criminalizing a common consumer choice? Now, decriminalizing cannabis is important, and it's step one. But we also have to establish a safe, ethical supply chain in Tennessee for our neighbors that might need this important medicine. We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. We have been for a long time. And you'd be mistaken if you're under the impression that we've made any progress. Recent data suggests that the problem is as acute today as it ever has been. But we have a tool at hand that can help us put a real dent in this crisis. And it's cannabis, of course. Cannabis is one of the most effective opioid-sparing therapies that we have. I'd like to tell you a story. It's anecdotal, but I think it's useful. This past summer, I found myself in Detroit, and I was in a meeting of social workers whose entire practice is dedicated to providing services to permanently disabled, homebound victims of automobile accidents. Every single one of those professionals report that their work has been transformed by Michigan's medical cannabis program. That their patients can dose with cannabis at home, enjoy the relief it provides, and move on with their lives free of addiction. And because Michigan law provides for the access to cannabis as a matter of 
health care. These patients can enjoy this relief without fear of criminal prosecution. But if a similarly situated neighbor in Tennessee were to make the same choice, they have to turn to the black market for relief. And what a terrible choice that is to have to make because black market cannabis is simply unsafe. Illicit cannabis producers don't concern themselves with safe growing techniques. They grow in untested soil. They use unregulated pesticides and herbicides. They commonly introduce toxic solvents to their product. And the result is often highly toxic. So, if you're a veteran in Tennessee, for instance, and you're struggling with PTSD, and you seek cannabis relief, not only are you subjecting yourself to criminal prosecution, but you're poisoning yourself in the process. The great thing about legitimate cannabis production is that all of it is thoroughly lab tested for dosage and screened for toxins. Now when it comes to recreational cannabis, the same concerns around the black market and safety apply. But recreational cannabis is as much about opportunity as it is safety. Did you know that in Tennessee, we have a fully integrated, legally sanctioned cannabis supply chain here in our state right now? It's true. But unfortunately in Tennessee, cannabis production is relegated to the hemp industry only. But what you have to know is that the difference between hemp production and other forms of cannabis is the genetics of the plant. So, if a hemp producer wanted to become a medical or recreational provider, all they'd have to do is order different seeds. And I can tell you that the, the Tennessee hemp industry stands ready to serve the enormous consumer demand for THC here in our state. We have multiple growers, processors, extractors, and product manufacturers right here in Chattanooga. We have a particularly outstanding testing lab, too. So I have to ask you, what is the use in criminalizing, again, a common consumer choice? So let's talk about the scope of the opportunity that's available to our state. And we'll use Massachusetts as an example. Now, Mass and Tennessee have basically the same population, but in 2018, Massachusetts opened its adult use recreational cannabis program. In the first two years, the industry exploded, and Massachusetts sold over $1 billion in cannabis products. And with a cannabis excise tax of 10 and 3 quarters percent, the program netted over $125 million in tax revenue for the state. Those are big numbers. But here's what's more impressive. Consider the gross domestic product of Massachusetts cannabis industry. Consider the jobs that are created, the skills that are learned. Imagine the wealth that's created up and down the supply chain. Cannabis is an economic force. The cannabis industry is a creator of wealth. But here at home, our legislature continues to simply opt Tennesseans out of the opportunity. So I have to ask, why does Tennessee continue to decline the enormous economic windfall that the cannabis industry offers? Oh yeah, so why do I sleep better in Denver? Well, from time to time I suffer from fairly serious bouts of insomnia. I can go a whole week and maybe sleep just a handful of hours the whole time. I've never been able to track why it happens. And I've only ever found one natural way to deal with it. And I found it in Denver. So a few years back, I was visiting and was in the middle of one of these insomnia spells. So I went to the local dispensary and I bought a bottle of low THC gummies. Just five milligrams a piece, that's not much at all. About 9.30 that night, I took one. Sometime after 10, I fell asleep. The next thing I knew, it was 6 a.m. Immediate, safe relief, and I never took a pharmaceutical, and importantly, I was never high. 
Look, I'm not personally a cannabis enthusiast. But bad policy is bad policy. And cannabis prohibition simply doesn't make sense. So yeah, it's a moral issue. But its morality has nothing to do with whether or not one chooses to consume cannabis. Good morals and good ethics lie in the choice that Tennesseans can make to end prohibition. Stop wasting money and lives on incarceration. Stop criminalizing health care and start prioritizing personal liberty. Cannabis prohibition is irrational. Cannabis prohibition is wasteful. Cannabis prohibition is unjust. And so, to my beloved home state of Tennessee, to its leaders, its policymakers, its citizens, I think it's high time for a different approach. <laughs> Join me, won't you? Thank you. <laughs>